step for man, one giant leap for Zambia. The space race, you know, America versus the Soviets, good versus evil, democracy versus communism, all that fun stuff. But despite what you might believe, America and the USSR weren't the only two countries involved. Zambia was also in the space race. Meet Mukaka Nikoloso, a self-proclaimed Afronaut in Zambia in the 1960s. He opened the National Academy of Science, Space Research, and Philosophy in 1960 near Lusaka, a culty organization where he trained astronauts, or Afronauts if you prefer. His goal? The moon, and then Mars. The training consisted of swinging on swing sets and jumping up and down whilst clapping in synchronization and rolling down hills in barrels. According to himself, he's the one in the cape, he had a really good rocket ship design, but he lacked fuel. Yes, this is the rocket launching site and my rocket is just here. He even tested one of his rockets by launching it in a catapult. To solve said fuel problem, he approached both the United States and the USSR and offered them a deal. In exchange for fuel and technology, they would get his brilliant ideas, on the one condition that when they eventually did land on the moon, the Zambian flag would go up first. The plan was to launch his rocket, the Dikalu-1, containing a 17-year-old girl and two cats and fly to the moon. Following this, convinced there was life on Mars, he would launch another rocket that would put Zambia on Mars just days after launch on Zambia's first Independence Day on October 14, 1964. But the launch never happened. Nicoloso, a clearly driven man who thought very highly of himself, believed his technology to be seven years ahead of the Soviets and the United States. He even accused them of stealing his technology, despite the fact that to this day there is no evidence of what that technology even was. It's easy to look at this whole thing and think, Ah, that's a joke, right? Well, it wasn't, unless he didn't share the punchline with anyone. Despite the ludicrous nature and execution of his endeavors, what he was doing was very inspirational. In a country that had just come to the end of a long struggle for independence, he showed them that they could not only walk independently, but they could run in a space race. <laughs> Swish. The movement fizzled out after America put a man on the moon in 1969. Nicoloso wasn't the only man who thought he could outrun the big players in the space race. Meet Bob of the Bob Space Program. In 1974, former Aerojet aerospace engineer and pioneer in rocketry Robert Truax assisted Evil Knievel with his jump across Snake Canyon atop the Sky Cycle X-2, a rocket which Truax himself designed. The stunt was a failure, but Knievel was keen on pursuing the next big thing, space. Truex told him that if he could round up a million dollars, he could make Knievel the world's first private astronaut. Knievel gave him a meager $3,000 grant to get going, but soon would drop out of the project entirely. Truex believed that if you cut all the fat that NASA created, you could make a functional space shuttle for a much lower price tag. His ground rules for design were make it big, make it simple, make it reusable, don't push the state of the art, and don't make it more reliable than it has to be. The idea was to create a competing space shuttle to NASA that could be used for private space tourism. To build his so-called Vokes rocket, he salvaged old NASA parts. He purchased four $70,000 Vernier rockets for $25 a piece, a $25 million X-15 guiding system for $36, $6. And instead of a $200,000 astronaut transport vehicle, he would use a station wagon. His mission control was also his rocket transporter, which was a Chevy van. The rocket, which was basically a pointed cylinder with a stool on top, had life support, which consisted of a tube leading outside for before and after flights, and during the 11 minute flight, the astronaut would breathe the cabin air. Altogether, the program would cost around $800,000 for a reusable space shuttle, compared to the 7.5 billion NASA sunk into Columbia. He put out applications for would-be astronauts that happened to have $100,000 laying around to donate to the project. He even appeared on The Tonight Show calling for volunteers, of which he got more than 3,500. Now when you first read about this, you say, hey, some, some nut, excuse me, went out and built his own rocket. Unfortunately, after years of testing, the rocket never got a human off the ground, but his premonition of the need for private space exploration has now become a reality. But the US, USSR, Zambia, and Bob weren't the only ones in the space race. 
So was Lebanon. In 1960, physics and math professor Manoj Manoujian started the Hegesian College Rocket Society with no government support to start. They started with small forearm sized rockets and gradually worked their way up the ladder. They even made their own propellant as rocket fuel was impossible to come by in that part of the world. They built their own rockets with spare parts that they could find in metal shops and the project was funded by whatever the students could chip in. In 1961, they successfully launched a multi-stage rocket, which got them some government funding, front page coverage, and in 1962, they officially named the movement the Lebanese Rocket Society. In 1963, they broke all of their own records when they launched the Cedar IV 90 miles or 140 kilometers skyward, making it very close to low Earth orbit. The final launch was in 66, and the program itself was canceled a year later following the events of the Six Day War, after which the Lebanese government had pressure put on it by Western governments to halt all rocket activities. This backyard rocketry wasn't simply a product of the 60s and 70s, it's still happening today. Australia is the only OECD country not to have a dedicated space program. So Australian space enthusiasts have done the most logical thing possible. They made their own space effort. Stuart McAndrew is one of the apparently at least several Australians who have made their own space things to fill the gap left by the government. McAndrew's space thing is a micro satellite called a pocket cube, spelt with a Q, of course. Full size commercial satellites weigh hundreds, sometimes even thousands of kilos and cost millions of dollars to develop and launch. Microsatellites, however, cost much less to make and can be built for around $1,000, and they weigh much less, around 10 kilos or 22 pounds. McAndrew's pocket cube, however, weighs just 20 grams or 0.7 ounces. Unfortunately, he can't just throw it into space, so he'll need to hitch a $30,000 ride. But let's get back to Africa, this time a bit farther north in Uganda. Perhaps inspired by Nicolaso's efforts in the 1960s, Chris Samba, the founder of the African Space Research Program, is currently working on a manned space shuttle called the African Skyhawk in his mother's backyard. The program is entirely funded by donations and they hope to test fly the plane within the next four to six years. His plans for zero gravity training involve a tunnel with a jet engine at one end, which he would quote, throw a guy in, saying that he'll float in the same way he would in space. The plan is to fly the plane up to Earth's lower orbit and then go from there. He sums up what you all probably are thinking by saying, at one point or another, every successful scientist has been called a madman. Again, it's really easy to laugh at this space shuttle, but we shouldn't. Regardless if they ever even get anywhere, they've inspired people to possibly become the next generation of astronauts, which is worth far more than just going to space again. It's especially interesting with the exponentially rising popularity of the Spaceflight Simulator Kerbal Space Program, a game praised for its realism, at least in terms of spaceflight simulation, that NASA engineers love. People are getting better and more informed about the intricacies of spaceflight at home, which is kind of the same as building a space shuttle in your mom's backyard, right? What do you guys think? Will Uganda ever get its DIY space shuttle into space? And how will Kerbal Space Program play into the space industry as a whole in the future? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to be real cool, you can check out my Patreon campaign to try and help this space program get into space. If space program is my YouTube channel in space is success. I'm really good at the metaphors. We did a Google Hangout last week just for Patreon people. And I thought, only one person showed up, so we had a real intimate chat. But it turned out there was a lot of people there and the chat just was broken, so our intimacy is now public. <laughs> we tried to do a game thing, but my PSN was down, so I think I'm gonna switch to Steam. So if you have any games you wanna play with me on Steam, because I really only have Civilization and City Skyline. So if you wanna play something else, let me know what games you guys want in the comments that I can get that going for next time. We'll do another Google Hangout in November and a movie night. I'm still figuring that out for y'all movie people. Let me know what movies you wanna watch, games you wanna play. We'll figure it all out. Let me know in the comments. And if you haven't already, be sure to click right on my face to subscribe or at least think about it.